All right. Well, thanks, Betty, for uh, kicking us off here. And I also want to add my uh, greetings for the for the upcoming season. Uh, we, as you might have noticed, have renamed our uh, Distinguished Speaker Series to the Global Speaker Series. And uh, we're pleased to have all of you join us this evening. Um, as you know, just as a reminder, we're an all-volunteer organization, and uh, we depend on your support to carry out our mission. And uh, so we do, do appreciate you being here tonight. Um, tonight, our speaker, as Betty mentioned, is Pierre Atlas. Pierre is a board member for the Indiana Council on World Affairs, and he's also a frequent speaker. And those of you who have seen uh, Pierre speak before, are, I'm sure looking forward to hearing what he has to say about this. And so we're going to turn it over to mm -hmm. Pierre and kind of let him introduce himself a little bit about why he's interested in this topic and, and he'll kick us off then. So Pierre. All right, thank you, Ray, and thank you, Betty. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, share the screen. Hang on a second here. Um, can you see? Yep. You see it? Okay, great. All right. And then let me... Okay. Um, all right. Uh, well, thank you for joining us uh, for the first uh, uh, event of the speaker series for this year. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Pierre Atlas. I'm a senior lecturer at the uh, Paul H. O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs, formerly known as SPIA, at uh, Indiana University, Indianapolis, uh, formerly known as IUPUI. And um, I've been, this is my fourth year there. Before that, I was a uh, political science professor at Marion University for 20 years. I'm a comparative political scientist by training, and um, this is a topic that's interested me for a very long time. Um, what we're going to do tonight is um, I'm going to uh, discuss very briefly uh, what is American exceptionalism um, and how do guns fit into that. Then I'll give you some data on uh, types and levels of gun violence in the U.S., also some data on gun violence in comparative perspective. And then um, I'm going to get into for a little bit uh, some of my things that I've done in my research, looking at uh, the relationship between frontier mythology and gun culture in the U.S. and Canada. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time looking at Canada because um, Canada is not just the ge geographically the closest country to the United States, but politically, socially, historically, um, developmentally, it's also the closest country to the U.S. And I think it makes for some very interesting comparisons. Um, and I'll go through some gun laws and regulations in Canada. And then I'll also do a brief look at some gun laws and regulations in some other uh, economically advanced democracies. And then um, finally, uh, just uh, give some ideas about what might be done to reduce gun violence in the U.S., more questions for you, um, but, but potential uh, possible uh, policy options. And then finally, we'll open it for questions uh, and discussion from you guys. So um, let's get the ball rolling. Uh, first of all, a little bit about me. Um, so uh, uh, academically, in the, in the last few years, my focus in research has been, as I said, on comparing the United States and Canada in terms of indigenous policy, role of government, but also gun laws and gun culture. And these are some uh, recent uh, academic publications I've had uh, peer reviewed. And then also um, I've done, um, I, I used to write for the Indianapolis Star, a column for 16 years. And for the last four or five years, I've written for the uh, Indianapolis Business Journal. And over that 20 year period, I've written uh, several columns, opinion columns related to gun issues. Um, also at uh, IU Indianapolis for the O'Neill School, I teach a class on gun culture and policy, which I'll be teaching next semester. And then every semester I teach a class on terrorism and public policy. And that also does touch on some gun issues, especially when we start looking at domestic terrorism as well as international terrorism. Um, I have been a gun owner myself uh, my entire adult life. Um, and uh, I served in the army, qualified an M16. Um, I, I own some guns, I, I do shooting, um, things like that. Uh, I'm not a hunter, but I do uh, target shooting uh, with primarily with handguns and I have some uh, collectible weapons as well. Um, also, as of this year, I have been um, invited to join the uh, Board of Advisors for 97%, which is a, a nonprofit organization um, focusing on um, gun reform uh, policy suggestions by bringing gun owners into the solution. And the executive director of 97% is someone you might have heard of, Olivia Troy, um, who uh, has become fairly prominent um, of recent weeks uh, as, a, as one of the leading uh, Republicans for Harris, a former uh, security advisor to um, P Vice President Mike Pence in the Trump administration. Um, and so I'm very proud to be part of the organization and I really look forward to doing things um, with them. So let's get into American exceptionalism. 
Um, it's a term I think we all are familiar with. Um, basically, it's about America's self-image. And really from the time of the pilgrims um, to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, the founding of the Republic, all the way to the present day, America's self-image has largely been that of a nation that is unique and special, one that's embodied with a destiny to shed light onto the world and even is divinely inspired and divinely, divinely directed. We've all heard the terms uh, shining city on a hill, which actually goes back to the pilgrims times, but then Ronald Reagan um, used it as a way to explain America. Um, America as a beacon of freedom and opportunity that attracts immigrants from throughout the world. Um, this is very much part of America's exceptionalist uh, image. Um, I would say as a comparative political scientist, Canada uh, also does that, Australia to a certain extent, some other countries as well, but this has been a primary um, image of America. Um, people are literally risking their lives every day to come to America, and this is as part of this beacon of freedom and opportunity. Um, a lot of Americans will say it's the greatest country on earth, and this is something that uh, we've been saying for generations. Um, and of course, America as the leader of the free world. These are all images and themes that, that fit with American exceptionalism. Um, although the content of American exceptionalism has varied, the concept has always cut across partisan and ideological lines throughout American history. Every president from George Washington until Joe Biden has stressed some aspect of American exceptionalism in their rhetoric and in their rationales for public policy. And I've written about this uh, previously um, in, in an academic uh, setting. Um, in American foreign policy, whether it's been isolationist or internationalist throughout American history, whether it's been idealist or realist, um, American foreign policy has always justified itself to some extent um, using concepts from American exceptionalism. So this idea that America is unique, it's different, it's special, um, it, it, it was founded in a unique way. The reality of American exceptionalism is, is of course, a mixed bag. Um, on the one hand, the United States was founded in an era of monarchies as the first self-governing representative, dem representative democracy, a republic. That's what, what the founders meant by a republic. And this was truly unique. It was, a, it was an experiment that had never really been done before on the scale of the United States. But of course, America was founded as a republic with slavery. And that internal contradiction um, also makes America exceptional. Um, there's really no other country um, that actually has that history to it um, of, of uh, slavery and democracy developing side by side and then with all of the other things that came afterwards. And of course, we're dealing with that legacy to this day. The United States uh, developed separated and shielded from the great European powers and the European power struggles because of the Atlantic Ocean and, uh, and the Pacific as well. Um, and America viewed its role and its rights on the North American continent as one of manifest destiny. And of course, that was at the expense quite often of indigenous populations. Um, America also tended to see Latin America as its own backyard, and that was codified as early as the 1820s with the Monroe Doctrine. On the other hand, America, uh, to this day, the world looks to America for leadership, and the United States does set cultural, economic, and political trends around the globe. However, compared to many other economically advanced democracies today, um, as a lot of us know, the United States actually scores lower on health and quality of life outcomes. And in many ways, unfortunately, America is a pay-to-play society and not really an equal one. Socioeconomic class and race and ethnicity often trump equality of opportunity and, e and equal justice for all in the United States, even today. And in the United States today, uh, a person's zip code can actually predict their life expectancy, um, which is also, you might say, sort of an exceptional thing about America. So it's a mixed bag, but there are very many uh, things that, again, uh, America is a, a, a place that attracts people from all over the world, despite all of its flaws. When it comes to guns, the United States is truly exceptional. No other major democracy has the right to own and carry a firearm enshrined in its constitutions or laws. The Second Amendment to the Constitution and also the vast majority of state constitutions guarantee individuals a right to keep and bear arms. Recent Supreme Court rulings um, uh, have made this very clear. Um, the Heller decision, McDonald, and most recently Bruin. In other countries, including uh, most democracies, gun ownership is a privilege granted and often heavily regulated by the state. No other democracy comes close to America's level of gun ownership. And as I will show you, the United States is the only country in the world that actually has more guns than people. America's gun rights are unique truly exceptional. We enjoy rights to gun ownership and gun use, including carrying guns either openly or concealed, and the use of deadly force for self-defense, 
that frankly people do not have in other countries, including uh, other advanced democracies. But America is also unique when it comes to the level of gun violence. We have the highest levels of gun violence uh, among other de uh, all democracies by far. I'm going to go, uh, I'll show you this uh, later as well, but um, the uh, International Small Arms Survey, which is considered to be sort of the definitive um, su survey of the number of guns per people uh, in, in various countries around the world, um, basically shows you that uh, the United States is the only country that has more guns than people, 120.5 firearms per um, 100 people. And this was a 2017-2018 um, survey. At that point, the, the estimate was about 393 million firearms in the United States. That's everything, including old guns and everything else. Um, by all accounts, um, uh, that number is much higher today than it was in 2017. And during COVID, uh, there was a tremendous increase in the purchase of guns, especially by first-time gun buyers. Lots of Americans have guns, including, as a lot of us discovered during the debate, Kamala Harris. Kamala Harris is a gun owner, as is uh, Tim Walz. Um, what I'd like to do uh, now is kind of go through some different types of gun gun um, violence and uh, and levels um, in the United States. I'm just going to go through some data. Um, put, to put things in perspective, uh, in this period that I have on this slide, in about a 10, 12-year period from the September 11th terrorist attacks through 2013, um, you can just see how many more Americans died by firearms than by terrorism. And of course, in terms of public policy, and I, I teach a class on terrorism, terrorism became a major focus of American policy, domestic, as well as foreign policy. We, we waged two wars over a 20-year period. Trillions upon trillions of dollars were spent. Uh, people were wounded and killed in, in, the, in the wars and everything else. We, we uplifted and changed our complete, complete security apparatus at home and abroad. Um, but in that period, about 3,380 American di Americans died um, including the almost 3,000 on 9-11. So that figure includes 9-11. During the same period, almost 400 and well, 406,500 Americans died by firearms in the same period. So in terms of the reality versus perception, in terms of what we decide to put public policy attention on and public attention on, um, terrorism clearly got the lion's share of the attention. It's really important to understand that we have to unpack those figures on gun violence. Because there are many different types of gun violence in the United States and actually in other countries as well. There's suicide, homicide, accidental shootings, and non-fatal shootings, people that are shot but don't die. Um, in the United States, every year, the majority of gun deaths are by suicide, not homicide. Um, it's usually between 54, 55 percent, sometimes up to 60 percent a year, depending on how you're calculating the data, depending on which sources you're using. But the majority, even if it's a slight majority, is always suicide. When we talk about homicide, uh, the death caused by, by of one person by another, um, there are multiple uh, different types of, of, of gun deaths um, by homicide. There's uh, domestic violence. There's uh, uh, gun deaths in the commission of crimes, of other crimes, like whether it's a bank robbery or a drug deal or something like that. There's gang violence. There's mass shootings, which gets a lot of attention, and they're very tragic. Um, there's road rage and, and the escalation of fights, which is increasingly becoming a source of gun violence as more and more people are carrying guns, including people that don't have to have training or permits as we move to permitless carry. A lot of fights that used to end in a fist fight or maybe somebody pulling out a knife or hitting somebody with a broken bottle, now people are pulling out guns and shooting each other. And being untrained, uh, they're actually shooting uh, other people um, besides the people they're even aiming at. And then we also, in addition to that, we have um, OIS, officer-involved shootings, police shootings as well. These are all different types of homicides. Then there's accidental shootings, um, non-fatal shootings. So it's important to, to think about these differences because if we want to talk about what can we do to reduce gun violence, um, the answers could be very different for suicide versus uh, officer-involved shooting versus a, uh, a road rage versus domestic violence. You know, we, we can't, there's not one, um, one uh, uh, answer that fits everything. In terms of collecting of data, a very good source is the Gun Violence Archive, um, and they uh, collect all different types of, uh, uh, using different definitions or different ca categories of gun violence. Um, they also maintain an archive um, or, or uh, running a toll of uh, mass shootings. And of course, different um, sources define mass shootings differently. The uh, GVA defines a mass shooting as a minimum of four victims are shot, either injured or killed, not including the shooter. So it has to be four victims. 
Other sources might actually say two victims or three. So some people might say four is too high for a mass shooting, but this is what they use. On that, um, uh, you, can, you can see that in 2022, there were 646 mass shootings. In 2023, 656 mass shootings during the year. Um, that's about, what, about almost two a day, um, uh, using that definition of four or more being shot. Um, you can also see I highlighted suicide by firearm. The Gun Violence Archive does not actually collect data on that. They rely on the CDC, so there are different sources, but this sort of is something here. And I have the website if anybody wants to go. They're constantly updating this, and they are cited um, by, in, by press, uh, by media all the time. Um, we have mass shootings, which is a, a relatively small category of uh, gun violence in the United States, but it, it gets a lot of media attention because it, it seems to be so random and it's so horrific and so pointless in some ways. Um, and as you can see, uh, gun uh, mass shootings have, have been rising. Um, and that, that 2023 data is old because I just gave you it's actually about 100 more um, for 2023. Uh, but uh, the other thing is what what is perhaps one of the most horrific forms of mass shootings are school shootings. Um, and we just had one recently, um, just a few weeks ago in Georgia. Uh, the Washington Post has a, a interactive school shooting database that they're constantly adding to, unfortunately. Um, I have the link for it here. Um, but basically, according to their research, since the Columbine mass shooting, school shooting of 1999, which really sort of set the pattern for everything that came afterwards, more than 352,000 students have experienced gun violence in the classroom in the United States since, 2000, since 1999. Think about uh, the trauma, the psychological uh, trauma, as well as physical trauma uh, that this that this has caused um, over the years, and and uh, with every mass every mass shooting in a school, you get more of this as well. As of 2020, um, sadly, and a lot of you have probably heard this, um, today the leading cause of death for children under 18 in the United States is gun violence. This is another case where the United States is truly exceptional among democracies, um, and as you can see from this chart. Um, race and ethnicity is a significant intervening variable in terms of who uh, is um, uh, likely to die from gun violence. Uh, race and ethnicity makes a difference. White, Black, Hispanic, Asian, and then the AIAN is uh, American Indian and Alaskan Native. And you can see that the indigenous population and the uh, Black African American population has the highest incidences of, um, of uh, firearms related deaths um, for children. But it's, it's in any case, it's horrible and it's horrible across the board. And it is something that um, obviously uh, something that ought to be addressed in one form or another. Maybe we can talk about that. Um, in the United States today, more than half of the uh, 50 states today have, have gone to permitless carry, um, which means that you can carry a concealed firearm without having to get a permit. Um, whereas before, uh, the other ones, and you can see uh, the green states are permitless carry. Indiana became permitless a couple of years ago. It, we used to have a handgun license. Um, which required a criminal background check and fingerprinting. And that was it. Um, there was no training in Indiana, no required training. But just the fact that you had a criminal background check um, served as a gatekeeper in terms of who would actually be likely to carry a gun. Um, also today, with permitless carry, police officers are not allowed to ask someone if they're carrying a gun um, unless they have a suspicion that something is going on. Other states that went to permitless carry previously had required um, firearms training or safety training, um, like Ohio, and they, they eliminated all of that when they went to permitless carry. So now um, people who used to have to have some type of safety training before they could get the permit no longer have to have safety training at all, and they can just carry a firearm. So that leads, I would argue, uh, to uh, irresponsible gun ownership. And I say this as someone who considers myself to be a, respons a responsible gun owner. Um, you can also see there are very few uh, states in the United States that have some type of assault weapon restriction. Um, you can see uh, that on this chart. Okay, um, non-fatal shootings is another category. Uh, one of my colleagues um, at uh, O'Neill School, uh, Lauren McGee, this is one of her, her areas of, of research. Um, surprisingly, uh, in addition to all of the number of gun deaths in the United States, and right now we're at about um, 45,000, 40 to 45,000 people a year are dying from firearms every year. For every um, gun death in the United States, there are an additional two to three non-fatal shootings. According to a study by the Journal of the American Medical Association, during the period from 2009 to 2017, annually, in addition to the 34,500 deaths from firearms, um, from firearms, um, there were um, uh, uh, an additional 85,600 um, visits for non-fatal firearms injury. So in other words, what they did is they just looked at, they collected data just from emergency departments at hospitals. 
who came into the emergency room. Um, and they were seeing uh, this uh, increasing number, two to three additional um, uh, non-fatal shootings, injuries for every death. But that's only the people that go to an emergency room. Surely there are people who get shot who don't go to the hospital. Um, so actually um, the number, especially if they're done in the commission of a crime or things like that. So the number of uh, non-fatal uh, shootings are probably higher than what the statistics are. Okay, let's kind of go into uh, gun violence in comparative perspective, go through some more data here. Um, as I said, the uh, small arms survey um, looked through a bunch of countries. You can go to uh, the website and they have all, all the countries in the world um, are here. I've highlighted a couple that I'm going to be talking about. Um, the United States, again, 120.5 firearms per 100 people. Um, the only country uh, that has more guns than people. Yemen came close. And then if you look at Canada at 34.7, that's definitely not anywhere near the United States, but that is a very high rate of gun ownership. Canada has a very high rate of gun ownership, even though it has a much lower rate of gun violence. Um, and that, that leads to some interesting questions that I'm going to be talking about. Um, comparing gun ownership and gun homicides from various countries. Um, again, the, uh, the chart on the left is uh, based on the small arms survey. The chart on the right is uh, homicide um, uh, gun homicide rates per 100,000 people. So the United States, uh, 4.1 in 2009, it's about, it's about the same every year, um, about four, four or more um, people per 100,000 are killed by guns in the United States. You can compare that to other countries here. Here's another way of looking at it, a different set of data. And this is looking at gun homicide rates in high income countries that have populations of 10 million or more. Um, and you can see again how the United States stands out. And these are not all um, uh, necessarily uh, democracies but these are based on high income with 10 mil million or more. So you'll see, for example, Saudi Arabia in here um, uh, as, as uh, you know, um, things like that. So anyway, so uh, um, these are, again, uh, the United States sort of stands out here. What is the percentage of homicides committed with firearms? Every country has murders. All countries have crime. How, what percentage of homicides are committed with guns? Well, in the United States, it's over 80%. Over 80% of all homicides in the U.S. are committed with guns. In Canada, it's 40%, half that. In Australia, it's 11. In England and Wales, it's only 4% of all homicides are committed using guns. Also, I'd just like to bring this in. The United States is a violent country um, across the board. The United States has always been a violent country. The United States was born in a revolution. Um, there's a lot of violence coming from police as well for multiple reasons, um, including uh, the fact that every time a police officer pulls somebody over in the United States, he or she uh, has to assume that the person he is pulling over might be armed. Um, and that might increase and ratchet up tensions from the moment every every single police stop starts. On top of that, there are other issues that that you know that we all talk we all talk about. But if you look at this, um, this is the uh, uh, the data on civilians killed by police officers in the United States compared to other countries. The first chart on the left um, is the is the percentage, the rate. So in this case, it's the number of civilians killed by police out of 10 million. So it's uh, it's, it's you know, 33.5 people out of a, a 10 million population killed in the United States compared to 9.8 in Canada, um, compared to zero in Norway. Um, and then the other chart on the right is basically the same data, only instead of um, as, a, as a rate, as a percentage um, or a number out of 10 million, it's the actual number of people killed that particular year. And um, I... Don't remember which year it was. It was in the early 2000s, um, 2020, it looks like. Um, so, but, it, but frankly, um, in the United States, the data doesn't change that much from year to year, unfortunately. Okay, what I'd like to do now is um, take a little bit of time to talk about, um, the, about gun culture um, in the United States and gun culture in Canada. And remember, keep in mind, Canada is a country with a fairly high rate of gun ownership. And so it does have a gun culture, but it's different than the United States. And one of my questions in my research was, how do we explain this? Um, so I was looking at the development of the of the Western frontier in the United States and in, in Canada. The, in the Canadian West, we were looking at what is today um, uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia, but really what they used to call the Northwest Territories, which was in the 19th century and early 20th century, is really what is today Saskatchewan and Alberta. And you can see that's ab uh, above Montana. The iconic image of the American West is the armed cowboy, and frankly, even the outlaw representing rugged individualism and embodying America's unofficial motto, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The American cowboy is not just key to American gun culture, 
the image of the cowboy is key to American culture more broadly defined. For Canada, the icon of the Canadian West and also the one of the icons of Canada is the Mountie, the Royal Canadian Mounted Policeman, the federal policeman in a scarlet coat who established and enforced law and order on the frontier. The Mountie embodies Canada's, Canada's unofficial political motto, peace, order, and good government. Many people who have studied uh, the U.S. and Canada comparatively have made note of the differences between life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and peace, order, and good government. Margaret Atwood, um, a very famous uh, Canadian author, um, once quipped, and I love this quote, Canada must be the only country in the world where a policeman is used as a national symbol. Now, in the United States, uh, firearms have always been plentiful uh, in the, on the American frontier from colonial times onward, and America always had a frontier from the, from the colonial era forward. Guns were used for killing game, for defense and offense against American Indians, for personal self-defense, for service in militias. On the post-Civil War Western frontier, which is what I'm interested in uh, academically, government presence was limited, law enforcement was often haphazard, and there were many clashes with American Indians as white settlers moved into lands promised to Indian tribes by U.S. treaties. After the Civil War, um, with the, with the uh, downscaling of the American military and no longer a need for a vast um, arms manufacturing um, uh, economy that was built up during the Civil War, the gun manufacturers began to market the romance of the American frontier and the concept of rugged individualism to increase gun sales, not just in the West, but on the Eastern, in the Eastern states as well. Unique on the post-Civil War American frontier was the handgun, the, the revolver or the six shooter. Colt's revolver was known as the peacemaker and also referred to as the great equalizer. The idea that it didn't matter how big or small you were, if you had a revolver, you could stand up against anybody else and you'd be equal. Um, these are uh, this is a, a gun that probably a lot of you recognize. It's a, a Colt Model 1873 um, Peacemaker. It came out in 1873 in, in the in a 45 caliber. In 1878, they introduced uh, a different version of the same gun in a different caliber, 4440, which was actually designed to fit with the uh, 1873 Winchester uh, lever action rifle. The reason I say this is because uh, one of the major distributors of Colt in 1878 basically wrote to the company and said, "Look, in order to help us increase the sales, why don't you call this new version in 4440 the Frontier Six Shooter? And so literally from 1878 on, they actually uh, scrolled into the barrel of the gun, Colt Frontier Six Shooter. This sort of, again, captures the romance of the, of the frontier, the romance of gun violence in, in, in a sense as well. And, and this is also what you see down at the bottom is a very famous uh, ad for Winchester. Also, uh, sort of romanticizing the frontier, rugged individualism, all these kinds of things. This was uh, marketing um, that actually helped generate new markets across the United States and frankly around the world as well. American America's uh, frontier image and mythology um, excited people all over the world, not just the United States. Canadians proudly counter the America's uh, Wild West with their own frontier narrative of a more civilized Mild West. Canadians on the frontier possess long arms, rifles and shotguns they use for hunting game and for service in militias and rifle clubs, which are very prevalent in the Canadian frontier. But the Northwest Mounted Police, the Mounties, which were founded in 1874, actually 1873, they arrived in 1874, the Mounties established law and order and moved the First Nations or Canadian Indians off their lands and onto the reserves prior to the arrival of large scale, large numbers of white settlers that didn't really come in until about 1885 when the Canadian railroads were finished. In other words, in Canada, the law got there first. The idea of a lawless frontier town did not exist in the Canadian frontier. In general, in the post-1867 Canadian frontier, government preceded white settlement. There were no Indian wars on the Canadian prairies, and there were no lawless frontier towns. Guns were not needed for self-defense against humans, only against animals. And thus, there was no need for handguns, because handguns on the American frontier were really pr primarily for defense against other, other human beings. They were, not against, they were not used for hunting or anything else like that back then. Um, Ottawa, the Canadian government, had a very negative attitude towards revolvers, and they were appalled by the violence that they were seeing south of the border in the United States. In Canada's first federal gun law, which uh, restricted the carrying of handguns, was promulgated in 1877, just 10 years after Canada was confederated in 1867. So Canada has had federal gun laws for since 1877. Now, it's also important to understand that um, the uh, the mythology of the... So, so on one hand, we have... There were actual differences in terms of levels of violence 
um, and, and gun ownership and gun violence in the United States and Canada in the 19th century and early 20th centuries. That was true. At the same time, there was a real distinction that a lot of historians and scholars have noted between the mythology of the American frontier and the actual history of the American frontier. Many scholars have argued that homicide rates in America's eastern cities in the 19th century were similar to those of America's western towns and cities. In other words, America was violent across the board. There was a wild west, but there was also a wild east. Um, and in reality, and something I, I've, I've written about, there were far more gun re regulations in American frontier towns and less interpersonal violence, especially shootouts and acts of vigilantism, the kinds of things that are always portrayed in movies. There were actually, there was far less of that in America's actual Old West than what was portrayed, exaggerated, romanticized in real time in Wild West shows and in dime novels in the 19th century, and also in all of our TV Westerns and Western movies and all that kind of stuff. There's a romanticization of, of violence, um, a romanticization of guns, of gun culture, of individualism at, at a level that uh, that was different um, than what we saw in the Old West. I mean, you don't see too many movies about barn raisings, but you do see a lot of movies about people walking into a into a town and, and killing everybody. So we all, a lot of us grew up watching um, uh, uh, Gunsmoke with a fictional uh, Marshal Matt Dillon of Kansas of Dodge City, Kansas. Um, the reality of, of Dodge City, after it was a wild cow town for a few years in the early 1870s, was the, the, the city government said, we can't have this anymore. And they passed uh, gun laws, including, as you can see from this photograph from 1878, the carrying of firearms are strictly prohibited within the town limits of, of Dodge City. Had the fictional Marshal Dillon enforced the laws that were actually on the books in the real Dodge City, every episode of Gunsmoke would not have ended in a gunfight. The most famous gunfight in American history that actually did take place was the gunfight at the OK Corral in Tombstone, Arizona in October of 1881. Um, what is not actually uh, known by a lot of people um, is that before that took place, the, the city of Tombstone passed a very, very strict gun ordinance, um, basically banning the carrying of, of guns in town limits um, uh, without a special permit. Um, in fact, what would happen, it was very common in a lot of frontier towns, was people would have to come into town and they would turn their guns into the sheriff. They would get the equivalent of a coat check, um, and then they would get their guns back when they left town. Frankly, I would argue that um, uh, this ordinance, uh, Ordinance Number 9 from 1881, Tombstone, Arizona, might not actually pass muster today, given the current Supreme Court and the Bruin decision from a couple of years ago. Um, but the marketing uh, was a major part of gun culture in the United States. What you see on the left here is a picture of a page from the 1960s Sears Christmas catalog where lots of toy guns were being sold to kids. Um, and they're not just toy guns, but a lot of these guns were tied to specific um, Western TV shows that were on prime time in 1960. If you look at the bottom, Wanted Dead or Alive, The Rebel, Colt 45, these were all TV shows. The names themselves also sort of suggest the romanticism of the frontier. This idea um, is still uh, impacts on us today um, in, in uh, the value that we place on um, relics of the Old West, particularly the Wild West. So uh, in 2021, um, this particular uh, Colt, the one at the, on the top, um, became the most expensive gun um, in history um, because it was the actual uh, Colt revolver that Pat Garrett used to kill Billy the Kid. Um, and it sold at auction for over $6 million. The gun itself, without that provenance, without that Wild West frontier mythology and history provenance, the gun itself would be worth maybe three or four thousand dollars as a collectible. But it's the provenance, it's the fact that it was used by Pat Barrett to Pat Pat Garrett to kill Billy the Kid that it garnered over six million dollars in auction. Um, I've been to uh, Tombstone. I used to live in Arizona. I've been to Tombstone uh, many, many times in class. In fact, I was there last year. Um, and what's really interesting about Tombstone today is that Tombstone exists and thrives because of the mythology, because of that most infamous 30 seconds in American history, the gunfight. And in fact, what really rejuvenated it was the uh, 1993 movie Tombstone um, that actually brought it back even more to life. And wherever you go, in basically every store in Tombstone, um, you can buy antique guns. And also, and I took a picture, a couple of pictures here, is pretty much every store in Tombstone sells DVDs of every movie ever made about the gunfight at the OK Corral. Wyatt Earp, Tombstone, the gunfight at the OK Corral with Kirk Douglas from the 1950s. And you can see this. So it really, it's it's literally the image um, of and, and the mythology uh, feeding into the modern market of Tombstone today. What brought me into this uh, subject academically 
was, um, again, I'm an American. I was born in Texas. I grew up in California. I went to University of Toronto in Canada for my undergraduate degree um, and then moved, moved to Arizona afterwards and then uh, Indiana eventually. Um, I was teaching at uh, Marin University uh, a few years ago, and a student walked into my classroom wearing a T-shirt that said this, Canada, living the American dream without the violence since 1867. That t-shirt t-shirt really sparked something uh, in my thinking. Not only does that t-shirt capture an empirical reality difference between the U.S. and Canada, it also captures Canadians' own mythology. And there is something, by the way, that Canadians refer to as Canadian exceptionalism as well. Okay, but anyway, I found that really fascinating, and that sort of led me into this uh, foray into research as a comparative political scientist. Um, to quote a, a, a Canadian um, a, a thinker and writer from a few years ago, in Canada, and he's talking about comparing the Canada versus the United States, the culture hero is not the gunslinger triumphing over opposition um, by, de by a demonstration of natural powers and anarchistic individual will, but rather the law itself, impersonal, all-embracing, preeminently social. This is, he's contrasting Canada versus the United States. One thing that I've argued in my research um, is that drawing from both the American Revolution and the Minutemen uh, uh, imagery, as well as frontier mythology, in American gun culture today, the firearm is viewed as both a symbol and a guarantor of individual liberty. And because of that duality of guns, um, it makes resistance to gun regulation so intense among so many Americans. A lot of Americans see any type of gun regulation as fundamentally anti-American because it goes at both the guarantee of individual liberty and also this incredible symbol of individual liberty. The gun represents freedom. The gun represents uh, liberty. Um, uh, this line I love to quote, who is the government to tell a citizen how many rounds they need to defend themselves? It tramples on people's rights and it tramples on our heritage. Well, who said this? A Colorado sheriff in 2014, and he was one of 54 county sheriffs in Colorado who had signed a letter vowing to oppose new gun restrictions that the state of Colorado had just passed after the Aurora Theater mass shooting. That, to me, it really symbolizes um, elements of, of American gun culture um, and, 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 uh, and, and how it's linked to mythology. Um, yeah, so, uh, and by the way, it is inconceivable that a Canadian law enforcement officer would ever make a statement like that. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, in Canada and the United States, there's a definitely an urban-rural divide. And in fact, a lot of people in rural areas in Canada, that's where a lot of the gun ownership is. Handguns are not very common in Canada. In fact, they're highly restricted. But there are a lot of people in rural areas that own, that own firearms in Canada. And they actually didn't like some of the new gun restrictions that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, uh, but in the United States, unlike Canada, the use of firearms and deadly force for self-defense and even for the protection of property has a long legal pedigree leading to today's stand your ground laws. Canada does not have that way of thinking. In fact, they have what's called the English duty to retreat as opposed to stand your ground. In the face of urban violence um, and spurred by pro-gun pro organizations, an American urban gun culture has developed over time, which crosses ethnic, class, and even gender lines. Some American city folk may not use long arms for hunting or varmint control, um, but they do value their concealed handguns for personal protection. And I bring up Otis McDonald, um, who, who was actually the McDonald in McDonald versus City of Chicago, a, a 2010 Supreme Court decision. And he was an African-American um, uh, retiree. And this is a quote from his obituary when he died in 2014. The tall, elderly, soft-spoken man insisted he needed a gun to shield his family from gangs and drug dealers that terrorized his Morgan Park neighborhood. He felt the Constitution gave him that right. This is also part of American exceptionalism, for better and for worse. And we don't see this in other uh, advanced democracies. The idea of people in urban areas, white, black, male, female, rich, poor, feeling the need and the right to own handguns to defend themselves. I'm going to go very quickly through some Canadian gun laws, and then I want to bring up uh, some other countries as well, um, and, then, and then wrap this up. Um, Canada, as I said, has a, a pretty high rate of gun ownership, um, but handguns are, are very uh, strictly regulated. Um, and, can and Canada, like many other countries uh, that, that uh, we'll see in a minute, um, in response to a particular horrific mass shooting, has implemented new laws. And in Canada, there were two in particular. One was a, a shooting, a misogynistic mass shooting at, at, a, at a university in Montreal in 1989, where uh, um, uh, 14 uh, female students were lined up and shot by, by someone. And then uh, in 2020, a, a really bad uh, mass shooting in, uh, in Nova Scotia um, as well. Okay. Um, 
So let me kind of go through this quickly. Canada has a high rate of gun, guns in civilian hands. However, in Canada, there is no constitutional right to own a firearm, and there never has been. Mm -hmm. um, firearms laws in Canada have always been, are always federal. All criminal law in Canada is federal, and they are enforced by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Um, as I said, the first gun law in Canada was in 1877. Handguns have been required to be registered federally since 1934. Um, and then there was a major uh, Canada uh, gun control laws in 1995 after the Montreal Massacre, um, in which uh, every gun, no matter what type, um, you need what's called a, a PAL, a Purchase and Acquisition License, to buy any firearm. And that requires a, a training course, background check, things like that. Any kind of gun, you have to have this license. Um, they divide guns into three categories non-restricted, restricted, and pro prohibited. Um, uh, only non-restricted firearms, what we call ordinary rifles and shotguns, do not require a registration certificate. You have to have the PAL to buy it, but you don't have to register it. Um, in order to get a PAL, you have to pass a firearm safety course. Um, if you are applying for a restricted firearm, you have to have a second course for that type of firearm. All handguns, as well as assault weapons and some other types of rifles and shotguns are either restricted or prohibited, not non-restricted. So you have to have special permits and registration. Um, in Canada, from this 1995 law, um, rifles uh, uh, can only have, a, center fire rifles can only have a five round magazine and handguns only a 10 round magazine max. Um, I, I wanna bring this up real quick, um, and yeah, cognizant of time here. One thing I found really interesting about the uh, purchase and acquisition license for Canada, which again was, passed in response to the uh, the Montreal massacre that was a misogynistic uh, mass shooting, um, was it, when you're filling out your form to get this purchase license to buy a gun, you have to state your conjugal status and you have to provide contact information for your current and former partner. And here, this is quoting from the actual law. If the signature of your current and also former spouse, common law or other conjugal partner is not provided, the chief firearms officer has a duty to notify them of your application. Okay, the idea is that if in a case of domestic violence, um, basically it has to be cleared by the partners to make sure that this person is safe in order to be able to purchase a firearm. It also says if you're a resident of, this is if you wanna to move to Canada, what you have to do to get it, to get it. You have to have two references if you're moving to Canada. Um, so after the 95, after the 2020 uh, Nova Scotia shooting, um, there was a, a much more serious uh, um, uh, laws were passed. Um, and basically um, uh, a major assault weapons ban, rather than trying to figure out what constitutes an assault weapon, which was a problem with our ban in 1994, the definition, Canada basically just came up with a list of specific items that they keep adding to. And they basically took about 1500 different firearms and banned them, okay? In addition to this, this is all under what's called C C21, um, which became effective just uh, last year. Canada has also imposed a national handgun freeze on the sale transfer and importation of all handguns in the country. A very, very um, mm -hmm. radical move in a sense. They also have a red flag law um, to remove guns and they also have what's called a yellow flag um, permit suspension, which actually enables you to per to suspend your PAL for reasons without necessarily taking other people's guns. Um, so it's it's less severe than the red flag. Um, okay, good, I'm, I'm, I'm on time here. Um, so what I'd like to do now is very quickly kind of go through, uh, hit, hit some other countries and then find, finish up with some policy on the US and then open up to questions. And the idea is we end at 8.30, I'd like to have ideally um, 25, maybe 30 minutes for Q&A. Okay, so um, first of all, let's take a look at gun policies in countries that have relatively high rates of firearms ownership, but also low rates of gun violence. So Finland, remember, uh, you know, the United States with 120 guns per, pe per 100 people, that's the outlier. America is truly exceptional. When you start looking at every other country in the world, if you're talking 30 guns per 100 people, that's a lot of guns, okay? So Finland has a very high rate of firearms um, um, and only about five, less than 6 million people, okay? Um, it has a very uh, large and extensive hunting culture. Guns are allowed, but only for specific purposes like hunting or shooting at a range. And you have to unload them for transport. You can't walk around with a gun. Um, a license is required to purchase all guns, they, all of which have to be registered. They have strict storage requirements. Um, there have been more, fewer than five mass shootings in modern history in Finland. Um, in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, again, a, a fairly large, uh, a high gun ownership uh, country. Uh, ser men who serve in the, in, the, in the Swiss militia are issued a, uh, an automatic rifle that they have to keep, but they have to account for every single bullet. And basically, crimes are not committed with those. But in terms of civilian gun ownership, 
Um, Switzerland has some of the most liberal gun laws in Europe, but at the same time, they have very strict requirements on what it takes to get a gun permit. Um, all types of firearms are heavily regulated. Um, if you want to get a high capacity semi-automatic rifle, you have to have a special permit. And Switzerland has had um, no mass shooting in over 20 years. New Zealand um, also had a high rate of gun ownership um, and uh, licenses required for purchase. Of course, it became famous in 2019, infamous, I guess, with the Christchurch mosque shooting where uh, someone who is actually from Australia, and I talk about this in my terrorism class, a, um, a white supremacist basically went to New Zealand and went to two different mosques and murdered uh, 51 people in two different mosques as they were praying. In response to that, New Zealand passed some very strong uh, gun laws, um, new regulations, the National Firearms Registry, um, all military-style semi-automatic rifles and shotguns, and, and all magazines over 10 rounds were banned. Um, Australia, which also had some uh, a very famous or infamous uh, mass shooting in 1996, changed its regulations, um, and basically uh, assault rifles are virtually impossible to get. Um, they've been banned, and uh, many, many tens of thousands of guns have been confiscated, usually with a buyback type uh, thing as well. Um, and actually, I, I made a note here, um, the uh, small arms survey for Australia is probably less accurate than for many other countries because there's been a declining gun ownership in Australia since the 90s, since the Port Arthur shooting. So fewer people in Australia actually uh, own guns than they used to. That's not the case necessarily in other countries. Japan um, has uh, basically no guns. Um, Semi-automatic rifles and all handguns are banned for civilians. Um, shotguns, air guns, and guns with research or industrial competition purposes, industrial or competition purposes are allowed. But even for those types of guns, you have to pass a training course, written psychological and drug tests, a background check. All firearms are inspected annually. Um, authorized gun owners are required to safely store their weapons and ammunition. A very few, virtually no gun deaths at all in, in, in Japan because there are basically no guns. Um, the, the UK um, also had some uh, uh, notorious uh, uh, mass shootings. Um, it is actually a really a crackdown on guns and, and made it and gun gun rights have been again there were never gun rights but uh, the, the privileges of owning a gun have been heavily restricted. Today, basically, um, all semi-automatic and pump action centerfire rifles are banned, as are most pistols and revolvers. Because frankly, in in, in the British law, um, any any handgun with a barrel shorter than twelve inches is is uh, prohibited. And anybody who knows anything about handguns, that's a pretty big. There are not that many handguns that have a twelve inch barrel. So it pretty much eliminates all handguns. And of course, the United Kingdom is also unique in, compared to a lot of countries in Europe and the United States in that most police officers in the United Kingdom are not armed. Um, France uh, has actually quite, quite a lot of uh, gun ownership um, and, and uh, it is actually a, a lot of different types of guns can be owned in France, but the hoops you have to go through to get them are very, very tough. Um, uh, guns are primarily owned for hunting and sports shooting. Um, but it is possible to get like a, a semi-automatic rifle with a removable magazine, what we call an assault rifle. But it's but again, you have to go through a lot of different um, hoops. Um, you have to basically uh, you have to uh, have a, a, a certificate. You have to be a member of a shooting range for 12 months before you can get the gun. You have to attend gun safety classes. And you have to have a medical certificate. Um, guns cannot be carried in public spaces unless you have a special permit, like if you're a banker. So there are specific cases, but generally you can't carry guns in public. South Korea um, also has very strict uh, gun control. Unlike a lot of the other countries I've talked about, um, most men in South Korea do compulsory military service, and thus they have firearms training. Um, but civilian ownership is highly restricted. Um, besides hunters, the only people that are authorized, only civilians authorized to possess guns in, in South Korea are competitive shooters and athletes, and those in security-related uh, sectors, like security guards. And those are considered legitimate reasons. You have to show you have a legitimate reason in order to apply to get a gun. It's a multi-step process for uh, the, for getting a, a rifle, even for hunting. Um, and there are about 35,000 registered hunters um, in South Korea as of 2021. So what do we do with all this? Well, looking at these countries and others, there are some common patterns across Western and Asian democracies and also Australia and New Zealand. Um, all of these countries have some type of government issued license or permit with multiple checks and steps uh, required to purchase or possess most firearms. Many countries require some form of medical or psychological evaluation as part of that licensing system. All guns are registered in some form, and the registry is maintained by the government or the police. Now, can I'm not talking about Canada, I'm talking about all these other countries, all these other democracies. In many countries, the applicant must demonstrate a legitimate reason in order to acquire a gun, and in none of these countries is self-defense considered a legitimate reason to have a gun. 
um, except in some extreme circumstances. If you can show that your life is in danger, you might get a special permit in some countries. But even in some other countries, they won't even give you a permit for that. The carrying of firearms in public is strictly prohibited in all of these countries, either openly or concealed. You cannot carry a gun in public. Um, some countries might issue special permits, again, for particular individuals, but there is no general um, right um, to do that with, with a gun. Guns are largely for hunting and target shooting and, uh, and competition and things like that. The use of deadly force of the firearm for self-defense is not lawful in almost all democracies, um, except for the United States. Most countries heavily regulate or ban military-style semi-automatic centerfire rifles, certain types of shotguns and or handguns. Um, and when new regulations or bans on specific classes of firearms were implemented, um, it looked like um, some type of amnesty for a period of time and a buyback program was carried out to collect most of the banned weapons. And then after a certain period, then it becomes illegal to possess them. So these are some of the common patterns that, that I've seen looking at all these different countries. My final slide, and then we'll open it up to questions, um, and actually I'm right on time, um, is what can be done to reduce gun violence in the United States? And I have questions for you guys to think about, and maybe we can talk about this in the discussion. First of all, what do you want to achieve? Okay, what, what, are the, what are the goals of new regulations and policies? And I think about this a lot, not only as a political scientist, but as someone who teaches at a public policy school. Do you want to focus on reducing specific aspects or types of gun violence? Well, if that's the case, we really need to distinguish between different types of gun violence, suicide, gang violence, domestic violence, mass shootings, accidental shootings, children's access, non-fatal shootings, all these different kinds of things in order to get at these different types of gun violence that together amount to uh, this huge number, um, the policy options might be different and the policy debates and, and, and the, all these are the different differences there. Do you want to reduce the overall availability of firearms? Remember, there's over, over 390, maybe over 400 million guns in America today. Uh, or do you want to reduce access to specific types of firearms, like say like an assault weapons ban? Um, well, I mean, I, I will say we, we and this may come up in the Q&A, um, but, you know, there was a 1994 assault weapons ban in the United States. It had a 10 year sunset provision and it was allowed to sunset in 2004. So it was not renewed. There was an opposition to that. The assault weapons ban um, basically uh, was problematic in the sense of how it defined an assault weapon. It was not based on functionality of the weapon. It was based on the cosmetics of the weapon. Um, for the most part. Does it have a carry handle? Does it have a pistol grip? Does it have a, a, a foldable stock? Does it have a bayonet lug? Does it have a flash suppressor at the end of the barrel? If it had any two of those things and a removable magazine, then it was an assault weapon. If it didn't have them, it wasn't. So what a lot of gun manufacturers did was they just started making the exact same gun without, without a pistol grip and without a carry handle and just basically get around it. Now, did the actual assault weapons ban reduce uh, the use of assault weapons in crimes? Yes, it did. Um, according to a lot of statistics, there's a there's a war of statistics all the time on on guns. Okay, um, but it became very problematic in its implementation. Canada, learning from that, basically said we're not going to bother about trying to come up with a definition. We're just going to come up with a list of actual models, and we're going to keep updating that list. And that's how overnight they came up with 1,500 guns that they banned. Okay, that's a different way of looking at it. Okay, but that, that's that's an interesting uh, interesting option. Do you want to regulate, instead of focusing on the guns or the type of gun violence, do you want to focus on, focus on the people? Do you want to regulate and restrict particular people's access to firearms, the mentally ill, domestic abusers, perhaps domestic extremists, um, other types of people? Um, what, what, you know, so, you know, and this leads to different types of policy options. Do you want to focus on the guns? Do you want to focus on the people? Do you want to focus on the different types of gun violence? All three. You, but again, uh, from a policy perspective, you need to sort of narrow it. I, I would say you need to narrow it down and focus on what you want. And maybe different groups can focus on different things. And not only that, but gun owners and people who don't like guns could probably come together in, in agreement on ways to reduce gun violence. Nobody wants to see suicide. Nobody wants to see gang violence. People don't want to see domestic violence, accidental shootings, these kinds of things. Um, a lot of people don't believe that just anybody should be able to get a gun. Um, so th those types of things as well, okay? Um, well, then that leads to um, uh, potential laws, policies, and programs to address these different issues. Well, universal background checks for gun purchases. That, that's something that's talked about a lot. That, that, uh, would that include person-to-person uh, -person sales and transfers, not just at a, you know, uh, background checks, but who does the background check? If I want to sell a gun to my friend, do I have to go through a background check? How do I do that? 
Okay. Um, there's what's called the gun show loophole. I've experienced that myself. I can talk about that in the Q&A if you want. Um, there are, another option is, uh, or another possibility for debate, regulation of firearms accessories, um, including magazines and magazine capacity, um, bump stocks, things like that. So you're, you're talking about accessories for the firearm um, as a way of, of, of regulating. Some of this might be low-hanging fruit. Some of it might be a, a very heavy lift. Safe storage laws. This is being talked about a lot with criminal liability for parents of minors who misuse firearms or who, who use those firearms in a commission of a crime. Um, <laughs> a criminal liability for parents who give minors um, a firearm, especially when they know the minor has mental health issues, like what happened in the Georgia case. Extreme, extreme risk protection orders, which are known as red flag laws, um, aimed at people who are a threat to themselves or others. Um, that's that's a, a very popular uh, idea right now. Indiana was actually one of the um, leaders in that with Jake Laird, the Jake Laird law, one of the very first uh, red flag laws. But th there are the devils in the details. How do you factor in due process? Um, what if someone just doesn't like their neighbor and they call in something and they want to get the neighbor's guns, but it's more because they had a dispute over, over where the fence was being built, okay? What about privacy rights, including medical records? These are all sorts of things that we, ha we would have to address. I'm not saying I'm against any of these things. I'm saying, you know, we have to think about it from a, a policy perspective. What about licensing of gun owners, registration of firearms? And I would say, as a note, during the 1995 uh, Canadian gun laws that were being passed, one of the proposals was a national firearms registry for all guns. All guns would be registered. And in Canada, even with peace, order, and good government, even with people generally uh, supporting the rights of uh, the, the good of society over individual liberty, with Canadians much more willing to have restrictions on firearms in the United States, there was a major resistance and backlash to the idea of a national firearms registry in Canada for all guns, especially in the, in the rural areas, um, not just uh, in, in the West, but in Quebec and in all of the indigenous areas of Canada, First Nations. A lot of people who hunt, who, who use guns for a living, um, the idea that they would be registered, they, they, they were, they, there was such a backlash that the Canadian government backed off of that. They imposed all the other laws in 95, uh, the regulations, but they did not do the National Firearms Registry. If Canadians resisted it, um, think what Americans might do. It doesn't mean we shouldn't propose it, but that's something, okay? Um, another thing that's being talked about, and, and by the way, these are not uh, mutually exclusive by any means, um, and is being funded in many ways, are, are community and police uh, gun violence interrupter programs, um, particularly focusing on youth and gang shootings, helping people with non-fatal shootings, all sorts of things. These are all potential policy uh, uh, programs. Are there others that you can think of that we can talk about? And then finally, and this is my last point for tonight's talk, as we think about new types of regulations, as we think about ways to address gun violence in the United States, as we think about policies and everything else, I say I would suggest that there are three questions we need to keep in mind. These are not insurmountable questions, but they're questions that we have to keep in mind. What is constitutional, especially given the current makeup of the Supreme Court? What is politically viable? What is likely to actually pass Congress or the state legislature? And what is logistically realistic to implement in the United States with more guns than people. Um, this is not to suggest that we shouldn't do anything. I'm not saying that at all, but I, as, a, as a political scientist teaching at a public policy school, I'm thinking pragmatically and practically, what can we actually do? What can get done in our current environment or even an environment where maybe one party, let's say the Democrats have a larger control of Congress, you still have a Supreme Court, you still have 43 out of 50 state constitutions that guarantee an individual right to keep and bear arms, including the Indiana state constitution. So even if you were to get rid of the second amendment, which is not gonna happen, you still have all the state constitutions as well. And you have it embedded in American gun culture. At the same time, nobody, no American, wants to see the level of gun violence that we see in the United States today. And maybe that's a place to start. So I'm going to end there. Um, and I actually, believe it or not, I ended earlier than I thought I would. I'm going to stop okay. sharing my screen and I'm happy to turn it over to Ray and we can have a conversation about all of this. All right. Well, thank you, Pierre. That was uh, a lot of information there in a pretty short amount of time. Um, <laughs> I, I sent out an uh, email to everyone in our chat. If you have a question, send it to me and I will kind of call on people in order. Um, if you have a comment to make, that, certainly that's uh, welcome as well. Um, since I have the... Uh, the mic right now, so to speak. I'll, I'll kind of ask the first question. Um, there are a lot of arguments about what the intention of the founding fathers were with the passage of the Second Amendment. You know, how have the interpretations of that changed over the years? So I actually, uh, I'm not going to bring them up, but I, I have extra slides on all that because I teach a class on, on, on this and I get into the Second Amendment. Um, 
the uh, there's a lot of debate about what was the original intent. Um, clearly, uh, the idea that um, you know the United States did not have a standing army um, at the time of the Constitution and and it relied on state militias. The idea that that there needed to be guns available um, for uh, state militias to have their weapons. At the same time, um, as I said earlier, uh, from colonial times onward, America always had a frontier. There was always a potential tension with Native Americans and also the need for hunting game and things like that. Um, I would argue, and I think a lot of scholars have also made the argument that from the very beginning, it was understood that there was an individual right to bear arms as well um, uh, for uh, defense of the home, especially on the frontier, um, and, and also for, for killing game and things like that. The fact that it didn't say in the in the Second Amendment you have the right to keep and bear arms to, to shoot animals to put on your table doesn't mean that the right didn't exist. Um, over time, uh, it became clearer. I, I would say uh, in the debates over this over the Fourteenth Amendment af, at the end of the Civil War, um, the Fourteenth Amendment was intended to apply the Bill of Rights to the states, um, and this was uh, especially to pro to, to protect um, freed uh, freed slaves in the South. Um, and there were debates on the floor of Congress in 1868, and you can actually go. To the congressional record, actually, uh, yeah, with the Freedmen's Bureau bill and the bill and the Fourteenth Amendment, eighteen sixty six to eighteen sixty eight, the debates on the you can go to the congressional record and see this. Um, and there were people who were basically senators and congressmen who were arguing, we need the Fourteenth Amendment to apply the Bill of Rights and especially to apply the Second Amendment so that freed slaves will have the right to keep and bear arms to defend themselves against the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and uh, and so there was an understanding again, the idea that that uh, that it was both. A kind of a public service um, and also an individual um, as well. That said, um, I have to say, as a political scientist, no right is absolute, not freedom of speech, not the right to keep and bear arms. Absolute freedom is anarchy. Um, the founders would, uh, I believe, be appalled um, by, by some of the, the, the levels in which um, there, there are lack of regulations um, on firearms. And there were, uh, there were regulations on firearms going back to colonial times and the early, early days of the, of the American Republic, including um, uh, you were not allowed to store gunpowder in your home and things like that, which would be the equivalent of controlling ammunition, um, other types of things. Um, and, and there's a lot of scholars have looked at, at all the different gun regulations that existed. So the point is that it was it was a right, in my view. Um, it was intended to be a right uh, for individuals, but it was always intended to be a right that was be, that would that would have restrictions on it, as with every other uh, right that we have. Um, so that that would be sort of my answer to that question. All right. Thank you. Uh, you kind of touched on something that Larry wanted to ask about. Larry, you want to kind of ask your question there? Uh, yeah, Pierre, that was great. I mean, your your facility with the history and the, the facts, the issues, and the options around this issue are as good as anybody I've ever I've ever heard. I, I just I'd Thank love you. to hear you talk about this, particularly having lived in both Canada and the U.S. myself, and uh, and 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 in hearing you talk about the differences. But in addition to the the difference in uh, or gun mythology between the U.S. and the Canada. I was just curious, and you touch on this a little bit, about the different histories of slavery in the two countries that's contributed to the perception, perhaps, that guns are required to uh, to oversee or control uh, mm -hmm. one group based on a perception of, uh, uh, you know, the need to, 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 to control. I think a lot of these things could be race-based fears and, and, and prejudices that people have. I mean, you talked about the need for uh, uh, for freed slaves to be able to protect themselves, obviously, the clan and previous to them, the uh, the uh, plantation owners uh, needed to dominate folks and continue to want to dominate folks after slavery was ended. And I was just curious whether you think that the different our different history of the two countries with slavery has anything to do with uh, people's feeling that they 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 need to have guns to protect themselves from one group or another. Well, thank you for bringing that up. Um, great question, and it actually, uh, I, I in my in my answer to the first question, I neglected to mention that part. There's actually a lot of scholarship, um, historical scholarship, looking at the Second Amendment from the question of race, um, and uh, part of the militia um, idea was uh, were slave patrols. Um, and some of you may know that the original um, organized police forces in the United States were actually slave patrols in the South, and the idea was um, uh, in in Southern states. There were laws prohibiting um, slaves and even freed blacks from owning firearms. Okay, at the same time that you had whites uh, organizing into slave patrols. So uh, some people have argued. I think it goes too far because I think it was it wasn't just about race, but race was absolutely a factor. But some some people have argued that um, the Second Amendment is all about race. Um, I would say it's not all about race, but that was definitely a factor. I'm glad you brought that up because I I neglected to mention that. Um, 
So clearly, when you look, look into the 1860s, uh, post-Civil War, the people who are arguing um, in Congress to give the Second Amendment rights to free Blacks were what we what we call the radical Republicans. These are the Reconstructionist Republican Party, and they were trying to to basically create and enforce equality in the post Civil War South. Um, and I, but so, but race and, and there's a, a book I assigned in my gun class, a very excellent book. It's probably one of the best, most even handed books on the history of the Second Amendment um, and gun issues, uh, and it's by a, a constitutional law professor at UCLA called Adam Winkler, and it's called Gunfight. And he actually has a chapter specifically on the through line of race all the way through gun, the gun issues from the, that time to the Black Panthers. Um, and all of a sudden, pro-gun people are putting are imposing gun restrictions because the Black Panthers are carrying guns in California. And it was Ronald Reagan who did that, okay, um, as governor of California, um, all these kinds of things. So that, that's really an interesting point. As for the U.S.-Canada difference, um, as you know, uh, Canada or the British uh, uh, banned uh, slavery much earlier than the United States. And, and as the United States was developing and as the plantation multi-generational uh, slavery society and slavery economy was developing in the South in the United States, there were basically were no slave slavery. There was no slavery in Canada, which is why the Underground Railroad ended up in Canada. Um, so you never had that real issue. Um, also, Canada always had a smaller population, more dispersed. There were lots of different factors um, as well. Um, but Canada always had uh, did not have did not have a large standing army. It had militias and it always had gun gun uh, rifle clubs and shooting clubs all over Canada throughout its history. So long arms have always been present in Canada, um, but the, the the cultural value attached to guns um, is in many ways more uniquely American. And we just don't see that in the United States, including how race was attached to guns as well, in addition to everything else that I talked about. All right, thank you. Uh, Trevor, you got a question? Pierre, um, great talk. Um, loved every part of it. I learned so much. Um, I can definitely say I got way more out of it than I thought I, I would. And I, I've been over here just saving different things I'm going to be reading about after we get done here. But one thing I wanted to just um, get some more information on was, you know, as we are going in, guns are getting more and more technologically advanced and we're dealing with certain things such as 3D printers are making guns now. And then we have ghost guns and things like that. I wonder how do we begin a conversation on regulating gun firearms here in the United States when the courts in our highest courts can't um, even come to a consensus on banning things like bump stocks? That's a really good question. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, that that question um, applies to a lot of other issues besides guns. Um, I, I personally do not agree uh, with uh, where the, US, the the majority of the Supreme Court is on a lot of issues today. I think the Bruin decision on guns was actually a really bad decision. Um, and I say this as a gun owner. Um, and uh, I, I think um, the argument the 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 the, the argument that was put, that was put together by Clarence Thomas and he wrote the the majority opinion in the Bruin decision on the New York Rifle and Pistol Club versus Bruin um, decision in 2022, I believe it was. Um, basically, was it any regulation? that didn't exist or did not have an analog in 1792 when the, when the Second Amendment was drafted or 1868 when the 14th Amendment was drafted uh, is not legitimate. So any type of regulation, this is his argument, any type of regulation on guns um, that didn't exist or did not have some type of analog or some type of parallel in 1792 or 1868 is, is unconstitutional. That is such a radical way of thinking. And that, by the way, also was part of the logic that was used to overturn Roe versus Wade and he signaled in, in that writing in the Bruin decision that, you know, hey, maybe we should look at other things, too. And that could actually be used to overturn Griswold versus Connecticut and the right to birth control for married couples. OK, I mean, this idea that 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 that, that this is taking originalism to a radical extent. And the irony was and I read, I read it is like a 40 pages. I read through the decision. He picks and chooses which history he wants to use to justify what he says existed or did not exist in 1792, because there actually were a lot of regulations. And frankly, the other side even presented, these were some of the regulations that existed in 1792. Anyway, um, so th that's a real problem. And frankly, you know, th that that majority on the, on the Supreme Court, really a super majority, it's going to be there for a very long time. So that raises all sorts of questions as to how you're going to get around that on a lot of things. Um, one way is obviously legislation that sort of, um, makes the arguments that sort of fit within that pattern. Or the other thing really is to do it in such a way that is reasonable enough 
that you can peel away a couple of the conservative justices who are not as radical as Thomas or Alito to support uh, new legislation. That, that's what I would sort of say. That hasn't happened yet. Um, but in order to do that, I would make a strong argument that you have to have gun owners as well as people who want gun reform who are not gun owners at the same table trying to draft things um, to get it done. Um, it, it, and otherwise, it's not going to pass that muster, let alone uh, state legislatures where you have like a Republican supermajority like Indiana. So it's a real hurdle. I mean, it's a real tough thing. And in the meantime, people are dying. Um, I, I think uh, elections matter. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll see that there's such a support for certain types of, of, of regulations, um, uh, like, like universal background checks, perhaps red flag laws, things like that. I would say try to aim for those things first. Um, but I would also make an argument that a lot of the gun control groups are really focusing on what's happening nationally. But the vast majority of law that impacts on us is done at the state level. Um, and frankly, a lot of stuff needs to be done at the state level. Down ballot voting is incredibly important. Um, and legislation at the state level is incredibly important as well. Um, that's sort of like a general 30,000 foot answer to your question. Um, but it, but there's, there's some like really big obstacles that are way up there. Um, to getting things done at this point. It doesn't mean they're insurmountable, but we have to acknowledge that those, those obstacles are there and figure out either how to get past them or get around them. Or again, peel some people off with things that are that 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 you can make an argument, yeah, that this this is okay, even by even by your standards uh, on the Supreme Court. I don't know if that really answers your question or not, but well, the way the way like you said, the way that the current Supreme Court is shaped, I think we're gonna be stuck at the 30 thousand foot level for a while so that's the way we're gonna have to look at it <laughs> well but i will say though i do i do think that there are um there are certain things where an overwhelming number of americans um support and i would say also in addition to the supreme court we also have the role of interest groups um and uh you know the nra um and and other groups uh that you know there and again this is why and, and frankly uh, I, i'm putting on my hat as a, a an advisory board member of 97 percent which is a fairly new organization, and it, it it has a lot it has a lot ahead of it to get done. But any type of organization that can bring people of different perspectives to the table to get things done, um, the vast majority of American gun owners don't agree with all of the um, absolutism of the NRA and of the pro gun rights groups to the right of the NRA. There are, there are pro gun rights groups who think the NRA is too soft. OK, and the NRA is losing a lot of its influence because of its internal corruption. All right. Um, but but the, there are most American gun owners don't think that way. But the thing is, uh, in, in this bifurcated society that we live in, where everything is is, is either you're, you're red or you're blue um, and you have to choose a choose a team. Um, if you don't have people, gun owners actually saying these are things we need to get done and we agree with this coming out in public and making arguments and working together, things are not going to get done. Um, and, I, and I think that's really important, too. So that's sort of like a, a at the grassroots kind of political level, as well as the 30,000 foot, you know, um, with the Supreme Court and all that. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Claire, you're next. And then uh, Sheik will be after that. Um, thank you for, for a very good talk. Um, I wanted to ask a question about parental responsibility. Uh, comparing the two shootings uh, in Michigan and Georgia, um, the parents in Michigan, uh, parents of Ethan Crumley were found guilty. And the most recent one was a shooting, a school shooting in Georgia, um, where I saw in the news that they basically have no gun laws. And um, how would his father was charged but how could he be found guilty if there's no law against giving a an automatic rifle to a 13 year old? Um, I just wondered what your thoughts on that. Um, I'm I'm blanking on the specific charges that the Georgia father was um, indicted on, but they were there were actual these were these were um, criminal um, statutes in Georgia law that he was charged with. Um, you know, prosecutors will always um, decide to prosecute. Um, using using laws that they think they can get a conviction on. So um, whether or not, I mean, there are ways to hold the, I mean, the father has been charged with um, a, a second degree manslaughter, I think. Um, and so, uh, you know, and that that provide, providing the weapon to a, an underage person, um, you know, I don't think you necessarily have to have a law specifically for that. If you give, if you give a weapon to someone who then commits a crime, um, it, under under regular law, I think he can be held responsible. Again, I don't know specific Georgia things, but he's been he's been indicted on specific uh, crimes in Georgia law. Um, I think the more broad thing is uh, both of these cases 
um, are going to set new precedents about holding parents responsible and liable, criminally liable for what their what their minor children do. Um, in uh, in both of those cases, what's so egregious is it isn't a question of, yeah, gee, the uh, the parents were not storing storing weapons safely, and the kid went in and took the gun and did a mass shooting. It's in both cases the parents actually gave the kid a gun. Um, who was underage, uh, who was, uh, and, and who was known to the parents to have psychological problems. So there are so many different levels of liability, I think. But beyond that, um, I, I do believe that there should be uh, laws, and this might be something also where a lot of people might, might agree on um, for, you know, at, at the state level, um, holding uh, parents criminally uh, liable for some things that their minors do. Now, that, that's a controversial concept, because that's not just about gun violence, but other things too. And, and should parents... Are, or should parents always be held responsible for what their kids do? Um, that's that's a that's a thing for debate. But the whole idea about politics, when it works, when it's functional, is that we actually have debates about issues, and we have hearings, and we have experts come in, and we actually talk about things, and we say, what are the implications of this? What are the unintended consequences? Let's draft a piece of legislation that actually tries and solve a problem. That's how legislatures are supposed to work. Um, we're not really there right now, but uh, th this is a kind of these are some legitimate questions that need to be discussed. And what can you do to hold parents um, criminally liable? Um, and it might be safe storage laws, um, you know, or, or those kinds of things. But then, how do you enforce that? Are you going to have people come into a home and inspect, inspect your house to see how you're storing your guns? Um, what about privacy rights? What about Fourth Amendment search and seizure rights? I mean, all sorts of things. But that, that doesn't mean you, you don't do it. It means you have to sit down and talk about it, and you have to have. Uh, let, that's what that's what people in Congress and state legislators should be doing to earn their actual salaries, right? In my view. Um, Anyway, I, I I can't I sort of answered your question, I think. I'm not sure if I did. All right. Well, thank you. That's a complex issue here. It, uh, uh, the, not, none of this is going to fit on a bumper sticker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shaheek, you're next. Hello, Ahmed. You're on mute. You're muted. You're muted. Uh, I was so excited that I forgot to unmute myself. Okay, uh, I'm I'm so I'm so grateful to see you, my friend and my brother Pierre. Um, I, I you know I'm on call today with the uh, with IMPD. I'm chaplain of our local police department. Uh, I wanted to first thank you, uh, thank uh, the um, Indiana Council for World Affairs for actually putting this together. And I could not think for uh, someone who is better than uh, my friend Pierre to to do this presentation. So thank you so much. Um, uh, you talked about a few things, and I think you heavily focus on the policy and regulation part, uh, which, you know, it probably, it's essential uh, to bring about the change that we need for a safer society, but there are, th these are probably out of control of uh, many of us. As community, as a society, what is our individual obligations, our communal obligation uh, to address the issue of gun violence until we get the policies uh, changed? Uh, the second question I have, I think you talked a lot about legally owned guns. I'm not sure if this is statistics contained illegally owned guns. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, most of my homicides that I have been on are carried out by illegal gun, um, gun uh, firearms. So um, I don't know if there are any research about this uh, matter or not. Um, and I, in Indianapolis, at least I would say, uh, our biggest problem is not the illegally owned guns. Uh, it is more of it the illegally owned guns. That that's a very good point. Um, first of all, I'd like to just say uh, Ahmed El Amin is um, he's a he's an IMPD chaplain. He's also a um, uh, Marion County Sheriff's Department chaplain. Um, he's also a, a guest speaker in my terrorism class every semester, um, and uh, he's a, a, a great resource and a great great person and a, a real asset to the Indianapolis community and the Muslim community as well. Um, let me say first of all, in terms of the the, the statistics, the the small arms survey actually uh, it, it's all that's that's the estimate for all guns in the country. And if you go, you, they they'll actually break it down per country for each country. You go to the website to uh, le legally owned firearms, registered firearms in those countries, illegally owned. It's an estimate, obviously, okay. And I think I think the estimate's low, frankly. So it does it does get at that. So that we're talking more guns than people combination illegally owned and legally owned. And of course, um, some legally owned firearms get stolen. Or get sold without without records being kept, and they become they they enter the crim the criminal uh, marketplace as well. Um, I think your question about the community is really important because it isn't just about legislation and politicians. Um, it's what people are doing on the street. It's lo local leaders, um, violence interruption um, programs, sometimes with police operating with together with.
community organization. Sometimes that, that, that takes funding and, and to get people getting paid for it. And that was actually a point. Um, actually, I saw, I watched uh, Kamala Harris uh, give her um, her uh, interview with the uh, Black Journalists Association the other day, like an hour long interview. I, I watched the whole thing. Um, and uh, that was one of the points she actually talked, they asked her about gun violence. And one of her answers was uh, violence interrupter programs, but to actually have them paid. Um, so it's not just volunteers um, because it's really, it, it's a full-time job. Um, and, and so you have you know, local leaders, people on, on local streets, um, you know, pay, uh, paying attention, um, though, you know, uh, whether it's peer pressure or other kinds of things. I mean, there's a, lo a lot of things that need to be done. This is a, what they call a whole of government response is needed. It's a whole of society response is needed as well. I mean, this is a, such a, an incredible um, problem that we have in the country. And it, it's rural, it's urban, it's, it cuts across race, it cuts across all types of crime and, and other types of things. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. And a lot of the a lot of the guns are, are illegal. So then the question is, what what can we do about getting the illegal guns off the street? There are various programs about that, but that raises questions about uh, search and seizure. It raises questions about you know at what point can police basically just grab somebody's gun? Um, and nowadays with permitless carry in Indiana, and I think you can answer this better than me, um, it's actually really hard for a police officer to actually get hold of a gun from somebody unless they already have a, a sense that the person's about to commit a crime with it. So if you actually have to see some guy, some kid walking down the street with a bulge, they can they can no longer ask, do you have a handgun license? And if you don't have a license, they can take the gun. That's that's no longer that's no longer Indiana law anymore. Okay. Um, I think I personally think, and this is going to be a tough, this is a, a a a high a heavy load to lift, but I would like to see permitless carry uh, actually repealed. And I'd like to go back to an, a licensing system um, in the United States. And, 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 I, and I think I, I do believe that you should have the right to carry a concealed weapon um, in, the, in, in the United States in, in a lot of different circumstances. I think that cities should have the authority, the legitimate authority to restrict where you can carry a gun. Um, but, it, we're, you know, again, you know, low hanging fruit. But anyway, so there's a lot of different kinds of things. Community has to play a major role. Community leaders, individual people. Um, if you see something, say something. But that also means uh, community policing. It also requires increased trust between police and community, mm -hmm. um, where the police can feel they can trust the, the people in the community and the community feels they can trust the police. Um, and in a lot of places, I think you know this more than me, we, we, that's broken down. Um, and that, that leads to a lot of social problems, not just gun issues, but that's something that needs to be dealt with as well. A lot, a lot, of, the, a lot of the gun crime stuff that we're dealing with are, are reflective of broader sociological problems, what, what, domestic violence. Domestic violence is a serious issue. It gets much worse when there's a gun in the house, okay? Mm -hmm. But the domestic violence is a problem whether or not there's a gun. And, and if you can deal with domestic violence, then the gun issue becomes less, less dangerous, right? Um, so those kinds of things. Anyway, I'm, I'm kind of rambling, so I'll stop now. No, no, I, uh, Thank you for the questions. Thank you, of course. Right. Um, I, I kind of want to maybe steer back a little bit to some international issues. You, most of the countries you described were what we might call democracies. What's yes. happening in countries like China and Russia, you know, authoritarian countries with respect to their, the way they deal with guns? Well, I'll be, I'll, I'll answer that in two ways. One, I didn't look at non-democracies because frankly, for the purpose of this talk and what I'm interested in, I don't care. Um, I, what, what matters to me are democracies because we're comparing the United States to other countries where we have similar rights, and then where does the gun issue fit? So, but it's a it's a very legitimate question. I mean, frankly, uh, in most authoritarian government regimes, um, the people who have uh, the the who are given permission to own guns are people who are loyal to the state. Um, however, there are uh, a lot a lot of places that might be uh, more authoritarian where people still are allowed to go hunting, and they have hunting rifles and things like that. So it really kind of depends. The idea of an absolute total one hundred percent confiscation of firearms by an by a dictatorship. Um, is actually rarer than people think. And on that note, I just want to sort of mention a pet peeve of mine, which is people always say that the first thing the Nazis did when they came to power was they took all the guns. That is actually not true. The Nazis came to power and Hitler came to power in January of 1933. And the first Nazi regime gun law was not passed until 1938. Okay. So for five years, there were no, the, the gun laws of the Weimar Republic continued in Germany. Now, what they did was they said certain people can't have guns. Jews can't have guns. Um, politically undesirable people can't have guns. But everybody else had guns, handguns, rifles, everything. OK, so the, 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 the large part of the German population continued to be armed until 1938. And then even then, um, the regulations were more really going after people who were of undesirable categories like Jews, 
and Roma and communists and anybody else who wasn't already in a concentration camp, basically, I mean, those kinds of things. So, so the idea that, that they, that, oh, the first thing, you know, the first thing a, a government does is they take away the guns. No, that's not the case. Now, Cuba did. Cuba, when, when the Castro came to power, they did seize a lot of guns. Okay. So it, it does vary um, from place to place, but Cuba came to power in a violent revolution and they understood the communists in Cuba understood the power of guns. Okay. Cause that's what they used in Nazi Germany. Um, they came to power through, through electoral politics. And, and and political machinations. Guns are not a problem for them. Um, and and uh, and 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 lots of people had guns in, in Germany in Nazi Germany. So I just want that's a pet peeve. I just want to I want to say because I, I always people say that I always I always get my hackles up. You know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We got time for one more question if anybody's got one. But uh, I could ask you one more question about uh, super majorities in state legislatures. Kind of address this down ballot stuff. Indiana has a super majority. A number of states also have super majorities. Does that restrict the kind of discussions that happen at these state legislatures? Yes, I think it does. I, I think um, it actually uh, it it restricts the 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 range of legitimate discourse on anything. I mean, basically, uh, what a super majority will basically do is you know they're not even going to allow certain topics to come up for discussion. They control everything, right? And and basically, the minority party just jumps up and down and screams. <laughs> And that's basically it. Okay. Um, if you have even a, a close division um, between the parties, then there has to be some type of cooperation because you, you can peel a few people off, right? And so that, that's why it's a really important thing. I, I don't think it's in the interests really of, of democracy to have supermajorities in state legislatures um, of, of any party. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I guess if you had a supermajority of one party for a very, very long time, it might take a supermajority of the other party to undo some of the problems. But in general, um, what I'd like to see is more compromise. Unfortunately, we don't see that uh, even with a, with a tightly divided Congress, you know, almost 50-50, and there's very little compromise um, across the par across party lines. By the way, that is not what the founders intended. The founders, the founders intended compromise. Compromise was essential. Compromise was essential to the creation of the Constitution. Compromise is essential to democracy. Um, and, and this idea of not compromising is, is actually small d undemocratic. Um, fundamentally, in my view. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Betty. You got a last comment here? And you yeah. Can... You know, when you when you bring up the idea of supermajority, you know, and Pierre, I think many people on the call. Um, I also teach young people, and trying to explain to them how governments function and they are government. You know, we can't talk about the government they if they can look at the government me and in terms of what, what do I, how do I have an impact on legislation and, and policy? But they have to know how a law is made and they have to understand things like we take a sentence that's going to change district lines, but how did gerrymandering start? And I think if we can fairly say the, the truth that both Democrats and Republicans is not a partisan thing. They both wanted to gerrymander districts, but we can't get rid of these supermajorities until we can get rid of things like gerrymandering. And, and that's going to have to be young people um, mm -hmm. who are hearing this and thinking, well, I don't have a voice. Well, you don't have a voice if we have gerrymandered districts. That was the intention. So well, you, don't have a vote you, know, if, you don't have a voice if you don't vote. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So the the steps to reach this, you know, I, I'm going to listen to this again because this this program has been so full of information. My head is spinning. I guess the first question is, are, are you willing to share your PowerPoint? Um, well, it's, it's on the video, so I get you're going to pu publish okay. the video, right? So okay, it'll be fair right. enough. Because yeah. I can, I would, I, I would totally understand. You said because well, a lot of work, of course, went into that on your yeah, part, yeah. and it's, this is your priority, your propriety area yes, of teaching. Yeah. Um, but you can, but share, yeah, you can share, the, I, share the power, share the uh, the video, obviously, and that it'll be. There. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, but I, I, because you think well. We can't just go back and change our history for crying out loud, the Monroe Doctrine. And I mean, we can't change that. Yeah. But it's it's a little bit like C.S. Lewis has said, well, you can't change the past, but you can change the end. So trying to convince young people that you know this will continue until you step in. And I'd love to tell the story of Matthew Frost, who was part of Parkland, and today's a part of Congress before he's even 25. And that's what he did. With the gerrymandering, I would feel less depressed if I thought people would step in and do more for gerrymandering. That I would just add, if I can say real quick, um, you know, it's not obviously young people, but it's, it's not just young people, it's everybody. 
in, in 2020, in 2020 election. But my, run, my the, runway is shorter. Our yeah, is in shorter. the 2020 There's election, 100 million people didn't vote who were eligible to vote. Yeah. 100 yeah. million yes. eligible voters did not vote in 2020. Yeah. So that's, you know, what, what do you do with that? Yeah. Well, yep, yep, yeah. All right. Anyway, well, thank you. I think we're, we're out of time. Uh, out of time here for the evening. Uh, Pierre, I want to thank you again for a marvelous talk. Um, this was some great conversation afterwards as well. Um, we look forward probably to seeing you uh, speaking again at some point in the future. Sure. But uh, <laughs> again, thank all our participants for joining us tonight as well. So Very with good. that. Thank you for coming. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.